you know, I think keeping up with the with the the era of where everything is big, I have a I have a talk with a very big title. So <laughs> it's probably among my, you know among many talks I have given. I think this is probably the la the biggest title I have. Uh, so so I'm what I'm go what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, keep up in, in the spirit of of the nature of this uh, summer school, and I'll make some broad brush strokes about the work that I did while being at UC Santa Barbara. And I, I think if some of you follow me, I've been floating around in the era of cloud computing. I, I spent some time in Google, and then I went to Qatar. There is a national lab there called Qatar Computing Research Institute, and then I've come back, and I'm somewhere between Google and Santa Barbara. So I've, what I've done is I've, I'm going to give you the glimpses of things that I have done and some of the challenges that arise in the context of the work that we have been doing for the last, past few years. So that's kind of is the spirit of the talk. And I hope I stay awake. So, you know, if, if I'm falling, dozing off, please ask questions. <laughs> okay, so, you know, the, the, the given is that we are really dealing with huge amounts of data. There are, you know, everywhere you go, people talk about data. Data seems to be the new economy, the new currency, new everything. But the fact, from a, from a, from a, from, from a computer, computer scientist or a systems guy's point of view, you basically, the challenge you have is that there is this vast amounts of data in terms of, you know, large amount of text documents, large amount of annotated images, and what's, what's happening increasingly and interestingly as, as we interact with these data intensive applications, we are creating really a trail of human activity in terms of these log interactions. Okay, and most of you are pretty, very young, but I have a privilege to be in an age group where many things which I read as a science fiction has now turned into reality. So a lot of the things that we used to think about as being really futuristic and, and, and forward-looking is now today's reality. So self-driven automobiles, uh, automated image understanding, and most recently what people have been talking about is, is modeling the brain. Okay? So, so these are all the good things that go, go with it. What I'm going to give you is the ugly side in some sense, is what are the challenges and where we are when it, when it comes to making this all happen. So, so to do that, first of all, let's look at the, you know, why is everyone happy with this bigness of data? So one of the things that is nice thing in the, in the context of computer science is, <clears throat> you know, somehow at least we have resolved the notion or the model among, among the people who sort of machine learning folks or, the, or data mining folks as well as database folks is that you can model the data as either as a table or a two-dimensional matrix and it seems to like, like a nice model. So somebody like me who's a, who's a systems guy, I'm very happy when the number of rows in, the, in this table or the number of rows in this matrix increases you know, many fold, and that, that creates a, a big challenge for me from a, from a scalability point of view, because very simple problem, for example, if you're only doing a duplicate detection in a, in a, in a, in a relational data, it is an n-squared problem in a, in a classical sense, and that's no matter how you, you do it, it, it can be just scaled linearly. Okay, so that keeps people like us happy. When it comes to you know, when you go to the data mining or machine learning side, what happens is they're happy because what's happening is you are increasing the, 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 you are increasing the width of the data by introducing more and more attributes. So there are, there, you know, people are already talking about having billions of attributes in a, in a given day, in data sets. So that, that gives, to, gives rise to the statistical hardness because it gives, you, gives them an exponential co complexity in terms of as to figuring out what are the correlated attributes and or how to build the right model. Okay? So that's keeping these communities happy and they can keep doing the, the stuff independently but what my goal in this talk is to bring together these two communities together and try to tell them that if we work together we can probably do better okay so <clears throat> you know just to and the outset 
you know, when I, you know, I, I have often confronted with is, what is that data analytics, what is data mining, and what is machine learning? And what I'm going to do is just, you know, take, take a kind of a teaching or pedagogical approach, and let's try to just distinguish the three problems in a very, very simple way. So if you are given a, a sentence, which, is, which I have shown here, and, and you want to find out, given this, this sentence, what is a database problem? A database problem would be is counting the number of times Apple appears in this particular text. Okay? Uh, the mining problem would be is you want, you're probably interested in the, the interesting pairs or, sorry, I, so this is not working. Uh, no, it's not working, I uh, think. Because you don't, you have that? No, it's okay. Well, I don't know. It's okay, it's okay, it's all right, I'm, I'm close enough. No, 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 I think it must be that it is not configured no, properly. Off. Huh? Now it's on. So let me, let me see. First, that is working now. Uh, yeah. It is working. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so just just to simplify things, the the data mining query would be data mining question would be is what are the most frequent items that appear in this sentence? And then as we go to the to the higher level, which is the learning problem, you want to be able to understand if a, the, a, the 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 concept of a fruit, which is labeled as an apple, appear in this text. So this is this is what this is what this is how you, you can distinguish that. So, so given, you know, if you know, if you think about just looking at the overall picture, what you're dealing with is applications, and the applications are generating, you know, are internalizing the, the modeling the physical reality, and as a result of that reality, you basically either have observations and and application-related data, and that on the left, on the right-hand side of your screen, what you see is is the traditional and data analysis that we have been doing for the last couple of decades, and and you know significant advances have happened as a result of the largeness of the data, and there has been you know the data mining issue is to find doing clustering and 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 data uh, sorry frequent pairs and pattern recognition, and the learning is the eventual goal is to to f model the the reality. In, based on based on the observations you have. So what I'm going to focus is I'm going to focus on this part and this part, and in, in, in the in the next few minutes. Okay. So so this so let's let's look at the the data management problem, and 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 the change that has happened in the last five years is that has been a that has been a tremendous par paradigm shift, and basically what has happened is essentially. Most of the applications that we interact with today has all moved into what is referred to as a cloud. Okay, so so what? And the question I think you know one of the things is, is we can ask is why has that happened? And I think I you know I can go over it, but you know I'll just I'll just reiterate. And the reason is that in the last decade or so, the data data the data center as a technology has proved proved itself. That basically, it gives you significant economies of scale. Uh, it actually, from a from a usage point of view, it does it does transfer of risk from a, an individual user to an an aggregate provider, where you can basically aggregate the risk over many 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 users, and that that is that becomes substantially better. From a technology point of view, is that there is one of the things that has happened is there is availability of broadband internet has made things very very different. Right, and the second thing, which no, not many people talk about, it is, but there has been also that the, this whole thing has been enabled because of the virtualization. And finally, I think uh, you know, since I, I heard a little bit of, that there is an ent entrepreneurial bent to this this summer school, and one of the things that you have to always remember that technology alone, no matter how good your technology is, it's not enough. For, for an inflection point to happen, it basically has to align with the business factors, and that I think is why uh, you know the cloud computing has been successful. So, so the promise of the cloud is that uh, if you're you know basically in the past in the in the classical sense, basic what you had to do was you had to do the capacity planning in in terms of what what your peak usage would be, 
Okay, so you, you f try to figure out or model your demand curve and what was going to happen for, for given your, that the ser service you're deploying or an application that you're going to launch, and based on that, you have to plan you know, judiciously as to what, what your capacity should be. The promise of the cloud is that you really don't have to worry about it. You don't have to create any infrastructure. What you're going to be given is, a, is you will be provisioned automatically that you know, as your demand shifts, we are going to provision the resources. As now, this is very easy to say, but it is very difficult to design applications and design design systems that can hug along the curve as your demand shifts. Okay, that's I think is is one of the things I want you guys to understand. Uh, so, <clears throat> so just just to you know, take this a little bit further. I think b given given that you have the cloud and 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 sort of provisioning of resources on demand, as, as you increase your, you know, as a service deployment becomes popular and you increase your client base, you can very easily scale the, the middle tier components, okay? The problem that arises and that has been experienced very early on was that data becomes the bottleneck in, these con in, the, in this architecture. And that's, I think, has, has been always, has been recognized very, very widely. And what happened with that is that people went away from the databases, which was a proven enterprise technology for, for more than two decades, and instead decided to use this homegrown systems, which are referred to as key value stores. Now, what, what they gave up in terms of using these key value stores was essentially all the goodness that came with the database platform, you know, the, the, the issue of atomicity, the issue of consistency of your data, the issue of uh, failure resilience and recoverability of the data, all that was thrown away, and instead you have provided this. Now, it's not that people don't need these, these good features. What is happening, and this is, I'm, I'm sort of, giving you an inside view, what has happened is, in, in effect, the trans, the, all the, the onus of building all those properties now shifts into the application layer. So the applications now have to do all these, the, the, those good things, and they have to figure out of ways to get around this problem, okay? Now, so if you're building one application, yes, you can do it. But what, has, what, what happens is now when you have in a large organ, uh, entity, you know, pick, pick, a, pick a, an, a, any internet company which has a large number of, of app products, essentially, if effectively, what, is, what starts happening is every engineering team start duplicating the efforts in, in order to build these things. Okay, so this is not a tenable solution that has been recognized at least by some of the industry leaders. I can't go into the specific, but some of the industry leaders have recognized that this is a problem and they are, they're kind of coming back full circle to rectify that. Okay, so, <clears throat> so, so the, the, the approaches of scalability, the classical approach of scalability in the database context was essentially when you, you, know, when you want to scale, scale, you buy bigger, iron bigger machine and that's how you scale. What, what happened in the cloud computing model is because you're dealing with key value stores where each entity is independent, essentially what you can do is you can take your data, which is sort of loosely related, and you can break it apart into many pieces. That's essentially what key value stores do. And as a result, what you do is you, re, you are able to achieve significant scalability. So that's kind of as, uh, where we were about four or five years ago. And I'm going to sk skip this, but, but essentially, you know, I don't want to dismiss the key value stores as being not very useful because I'm a database guy. What comes out is there are, there are certain design principles where, which you can learn from and try to infuse, try to use that as a feedback into the database technology that you're going to build for the cloud. So that's kind of is what, what uh, you can learn from. So one of the things that comes out is in, when, you are, when you're dealing with, with, with uh, you know, database type of uh, uh, applications in the context of the cloud, there is this notion of a system data and, and, and the application data, and you want to decouple that. And you, the system data has to do with as to how your applications are using multiple resources and what kind of mappings you have and things like that, and you want to maintain 
that very, very coherently and consistently. The other thing what happens is even though in the context of the cloud you're using many machines, as far as the user interactions are concerned, you want to, you want to isolate the user interaction to a single machine. Okay, so that's, that's you know, what Peter talked about. This is the latency sensitivity that comes into play. If you start doing a very, very complex distributed transaction in the, using many machines, for us, every user interactions, it's not going to go very well. Okay, the, the third thing that comes out, I'm going to go it, into a bit more detail, is that you want to, to, to sort of decouple the notion of ownership of data from the data storage itself. And the, and the reason is you want the ownership to kind of float around depending upon failures and, and, and kind of automatic scaling and things like that, but, but you don't want that to be coupled with data movement. And finally, that you know, if, if need be, some amount of distributed synchronization is okay. Okay, so, so how do we go about doing, building scalable databases in the cloud? Well, there are, there are kind of, we have two endpoints if you think about it. So one is the, you know, the traditional databases, and what you can do is you basically take the traditional databases where the, the philosophy is that you treat data as a whole and try to figure out if you can break it into smaller pieces. And that's has, that, has, that is what has been done in the past few years in, in, in a, multiple systems, both in academic settings as well as, as commercially. So in particular, for example, Google F1, Google's F1, uh, which, is, which is used widely inside Google, basically uses that technique. The other approach is, is, is you, take, you start from key value stores as, a, as your building block and try to infuse some of the database principles in that context, and I refer to that as fusion, so you bring keys together and try to treat them into coarser, granular, atomic entities. So there are, you know, once again, there are, there are pieces of work that has been gone, that has, that exist in that context. And uh, so the G store is, is from my group and mega store is, uh, is uh, from Google, where they basically designed a system where entities were grouped together to, to, to fuse the multiple keys as a, as a, more coarser notion. So, so the so the basic idea about uh, you know this is this is the the basic building block is is really to partition the data, and the partitioning of the data has been around you know the table partitioning idea has been around in databases for a long time. So what is different? So the difference is that I think you have to do to a, a more careful or more semantically richer partitioning where you tr try to take into account the schema information itself to break the data apart. Because if you, if you just do kind of, you know, uh, a simple table partitioning where you just throw the tables and may break the tables into pieces and, and store them in, on multiple machines, what can, what, what can happen is many of your interactions, the so user interactions will end up having distributed uh, Synchronization problem. So, so this is this is basically was the idea of of uh, the work that we did in Elastras and SQL Azure from Microsoft and F1. They all have the similar similar idea. So, you basically do your data partitioning into the smallest granule based on based on your schema structure. And this obviously lim it does not provide you know it does not deal with all possible schemas. But if you especially have tree structured schema, which is very often the case. Then you are you can you can do this very very easily, relatively easily. I shouldn't say that. <laughs> yeah. The there has been also uh, you know from from Sam Madden's group at MIT, they have also looked at this issue from a different point of view. They basically did the workload aware partitioning, and and the idea was you use you learn from the workload and based on that you break the data apart so that there is minimal sort of synchronization across these partitions. Okay, so I'm going to, so, so with that I think you can, you know, once you, once you accept this idea, then, then you can go about building, building an architecture which will be much more cloud friendly and which will allow you to do database-like activities in the context of cloud. So essentially, what you have is 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 this, you know so the the most important thing is the is this 
metadata manager which basically maintains the system level information where it maintains what the mappings are. Is there a question? Okay, and and you have you have you have these 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 transaction manager, which are managing some subset of the partitions. So essentially, if you look deep down inside, is is uh, there is there is a master which maintains the mapping of partitions to the transaction manager, and essentially this gives you enough. You know, if if there if a if a particular transaction manager becomes overwhelmed because of, because of the workload, you can take those partition and you can split across many and similarly you can group them together so that's that's basically the idea and the and the the, the assumption here is is at least in the in the data center setting that your your storage layer is is independent from your execution layer which is which I'll come to again later part of my talk okay so in the in the context of data fusion the idea is essentially you want to be able to do is is you you have these keys around and the problem is the the read modify write that you can do is is only at the single key level but there are many applications which want to be able to do perform perform these application interactions on a group of keys in the in a transactional manner so 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 megastore what it did was it basically allowed you to statically group the keys together so that you are they are allocated on a single machine and and that's how they they manage the atmicity of these multiple keys the tra transactional access to these multiple keys in in the g store mechanism uh, the system that we we that i referred to what we did was basically we allowed the dynamic grouping of the keys and the idea was that that if these key you know these keys could be scattered on multiple machines what you do is because you can you without doing because you have decoupled the ownership and the data storage what you can do is you can bring the ownership of these keys to a single machine in a dynamic manner and then you can treat that as an atomic entity for the time of the duration of the of the access and basically once that is done then you can you can disband the, the group so that's that's basically the conceptual idea okay I am going to so 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 this is this is the the you know the essentially this was what I did was was talked about this how do you scale database technology in the context of cloud now another thing that comes in the context of the cloud is that you also want to make your your underlying platform or underlying database technology to what what is referred to as being elastic which is being able to scale it on on fewer machines to many machines and many machines to fewer machines depending upon your workload so what what this means is that you are you have to be able to do what is referred to as database migration okay so you you without without interrupting so so without doing you know without bringing down everything you want to do on the fly live migration of databases from one machine to the other okay so the idea of live migration has been around for some time so the for example in the context of virtual machine there have there have been several proposals for doing the vm migration in in a live manner the difference is i think when we, when we are dealing with the databases is that you have the the storage component associated with it and that i think becomes a becomes a, an issue so i'm going to <laughs> Skip over that you part. Until, uh, I I have an hour, but I want to spend. So I okay. So 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 I'm going to flip through the slides. These, these are you know. So so this is um, you know. So the idea of elasticity is is essentially it ca comes in the context of uh, you know you take a multi-tenancy type of a, an application where you are a database provider and you are you are hosting multiple database users on 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 your on your on your system and and for as a provider what you would like to do is you want to use minimal resources because you want to maximize your profit so you want to you know you want to start out with as few resources as needed in order to satisfy your customers be reasonably well but when when the number of customers or number of access, access work, the workload increases what you don't want to do is you don't want to upset these people so you want to be able to satisfy them by 
scaling them out onto more machines. So that's kind of is the idea. And, as, and similarly, when, when things become, you know, there are fewer users, the workload reduces, you want to consolidate. That's kind of is, is what you want to be able to do. By the way, this is not only for, you know, I, I gave you an example of a, of a, of a a database provider, but you can pick, you know, Google or Amazon or Yahoo. They all want to be able to do that because they are all realizing that, you know, as as the footprints of these applications become large, there is there is a cost associated with using these infrastructures. So this this whole idea, this model, is being recognized as an important model. So. <clears throat> So the idea is, I think uh, you can. So the, the data mi data migration actually depends upon the the store so the the database model that you're using. There is something called the shared disk model, and there is a shared nothing model. So if it is a shared disk model, then it is a relatively simple. The migration itself is relatively simple. What you have is you have the the database state and the transaction state, and you want to move this. So you want to move the state. To, to another place, so you have to basically figure out, I'm, I'm not going to go into the details, but you have to figure out a way in a safe manner to be able to migrate this, this memory state from the cache and from the transaction state and move it to, some other, to, an, to another site and switch your, your users, the users, the live users from one machine to the other and, and the, 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 the challenge, the technical challenge is how do you do that in a safe manner, right? Without aborting transactions and without disrupting the whole thing. So that's kind of is, is, is the idea. So I'm, I'm sketching out the problem formulation. I'm not going to go into the details of the, of, of the solution. So this is uh, some performance numbers, which is, I'm not. In the, in the shared nothing architecture, things become a little bit more complicated and I, you know, you know, one of the one of the papers that we had is we basically had a solution where all accesses happen through a through an access method like a like a B tree or something like that. If you're if you take that, if you if you're given that environment, then what you can do is you can basically take the access structure, you freeze it, essentially don't allow anything happening on the left hand side, and you you copy the access method, and then as as activities happen, you populate your database. Okay. Um, although this is a solution that that exists, I think in the cloud computing model, just this whole idea of moving data from one place to the other is not a tenable solution. So that I'm going to come to that in in the latter part of my talk. Okay. This is where I want to go. So so let's let's talk about learning. Okay. And I'm 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 going to I'm going to so I'm not a machine learning person, but I think what I did was I, I spent a year at QCRI, and one of the nice things in QCRI was I was able to interact with people from multiple disciplines. And, and I think during that, I, I think I got some education and a, and a basic understanding, at, I would say, a freshman level understanding of what, what machine learning is. So if there is ML people, I don't want them to be offended. I'm, I'm really not standing here as an expert, but I'm more standing here as a student here. So what I understand is the following. Is, you know, from a machine learning point of view, when we talk about application and collecting information, sort of observational information related to the application, you know, like your Facebook interactions and, 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 and in anything you do on a shopping site and things like that, from their point of view, these are really examples or observation of what the real model is. Okay? So the holy grail of machine learning is to be able to find a model so that you can explain user behaviors, for example. Okay? So that's, that's, that's what, that's what uh, you know. And here is a sort of one slide summary of what you would want to be able to do. <coughs> So given that you have, you know, and, and in this case, I've taken two-dimensional uh, so, sort, of, sort of observations in the two-dimensional space. So you, here are your observations, which is the xi's and xj's are the represents sort of the elements. You know, the user was, the user was uh, 
UCSB professor, lives in Southern California, and, and so on, all, that, all those things. And, and the YI is a label associated with this. So whether I, I buy something or not buy something. So that's a positive. And so, they, so we are just looking at the binary result. So given this distribution, what you want to be able to do, so you now have to think about, even though I'm showing you on a two-dimensional surface, you, you know, this is obviously, these are multi-dimensional features, okay? So in this multi-dimensional feature space, what you want to be able to do is find a surface or find a, a line in the context of a two-dimensional where you can explain the positive or negative behavior or separate the positive or negative behavior with respect to that model. Okay? And generally, I think given our constraints, these surfaces are, are, are linear. Right? Essentially, you, you, you build linear models because anything beyond linear models becomes much too complicated and I don't think we have reached this, to the level where we can deal with non-linear models. Okay? Now, given that we are restricting ourselves to linear model, what's going to happen is you are going to have some, some errors. Right? So, so you draw the line and something which should have been positive is negative, and something that has been negative which is, is positive. So it's in the wrong side of the line. So what that means is that you want to figure out your hypothesis, and with respect to the hypothesis, you want to measure the error that has happened, and there, is, there are some clever tricks with regard to the, what is referred to as regularization. For the, for the purpose of this talk, let's not worry about it. It just has to do with uh, Picking the line which is the nicest one in some sense, okay, and that's kind of is a mathematical formulation, okay. So this is this is where this is what the learning you know the ML folks will do. Now the 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 really exciting thing comes in is that you want to do all this in a big data setting, and what you what you what you want to be able to do this is when you have feature space which is of the order of billion features, okay. So, so there are there are you know people are talking about building models over feature sets that are that large. So these are these are columns, the number of columns going over, over a billion. Okay. So this the, so the the question is how do you do this when you have large amount of data? Okay, so that you have large number of observations which could be easily in the in the ten to you know. In the, in the trillion, and it is very wide. Okay, so so just to formalize uh, the the model is you you create you 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 formulate your hypothesis function based on that hypothesis function. You formulate your your uh, you know the loss function or the error space. So you want to you what you want to do is you want to minimize the cost. Okay. And the, and the typical solution for minimizing the cost is often this function is fairly, you know, it's not, it's, it's not, uh, it's not differentiable. If it was differentiable, you could easily do it mathematically and, and, and be done with it. So you want to, you, you end up using these techniques from, from, from linear algebra, which is basically based on some iterative functions, and these are based on what is referred to as a gradient descent. Okay, so this is where kind of, you know, our interesting things happen from a systems point of view. So now I, I will take that and I will, I'll convert this program into an iterative program, which, which is what I understand. And essentially what you're doing is that you're, you're reading the parameter space or the feature space, you're computing the gradient, and then you are writing back the next sort of, the, the values for the next iteration, and then and then you just iterate over it. So this is this is what you what what the function function is. Now the the the, the 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 problem is that given the size of this this the feature space and the amount of data that you have to do in order to compute the gradient, you want to be able to do this in parallel and distributed manner. Okay, so so you can you can actually do. You know, you can look at, there are two aspects of, of, of data here. One is, 
is the number of rows in the matrix. So you go back to my matrix and look at the, the number of rows. That itself, I said, is, is, is already in the, ten, in the trillion range. And, and the other one is, is the number of columns, which is the feature, which is in the, of the order of billion. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on the feature partitioning just, just for, for, for this discussion. And, and what, what we are going to do is we are going to partition the feature space into multiple sort of disjoint parts. Okay? And the idea would be is by partitioning these feature space, I can, I can compute this feature space in parallel, and that's how I'll be able to expedite my processing. Okay, is, that every, is that clear to everyone as to where I'm going? Okay, so, so, so here, here what we have is you have, you know, I, I, I took my feature space and I created D partitions over it. And now instead of reading that billion variables, I, I'm, I, my problem is to read these partitions, compute the gradient, and each of these parallel thread of worker is responsible for one part of the, one partition, okay? So unfortunate part is that you, can, it, you cannot completely parallelize the computation. There is a dependency that is you have to read all these features before you can compute the gradient. So you have to read all the partitions even though you are only manipulating, writing, or modifying, or updating a single partition. Okay? Is the dependency clear? Okay, so... So what happens is essentially since you are doing this iteratively, you, you can immediately see that there is, a, there is a synchronization issue that comes into play. Is that, you know, when I'm trying to read all the partition, I have to make sure that everybody else has finished up to a certain stage before, you know, the values are available for the next iteration. So as I'm going, I'm doing iteration, each iteration I have to make sure, so there is some amount of read synchronization. Similarly, there is a write synchronization which tells me that I can't go and write something because if there, there might be somebody who has not read the, the, the value that I had created in the, pre in the previous iteration. Is that clear to everyone? Okay, so the classical technique is, uh, is what is referred to as process-centric synchronization. I mean, most ML papers that you pick, what they do is they, they, they use this notion of BSP or bulk synchronous parallel where essentially they use the analog of our mutual exclusion or operating systems principle where they, they basically create barriers, okay? So, so the barrier, if you, if you formulate it as a, as, a, as a formal condition, essentially what the barrier is saying is that before I can perform my read, I have to make sure everybody has finished their rights of the previous thing because until they have finished that, I know that my, the reads are not ready for me. Okay, I'm not, you know, I cannot read. The data is not available to me. Similarly, when I, when I come here, I have to make sure that all the readers have finished their reads in, the, in this current iteration before I can write. That's, that's what these conditions is saying. Now, obviously, if you have this level of synchronization, then, you know, your hope of making this uh, faster is not, not very, you know, it, it doesn't work because essentially what happens in this context is you are, you are, you're the, the amount of speed up or, or parallelism you get is blocked by the slowest computer, or slowest worker in your, in your com computation. So you could have thousands of workers, but if there is one slow worker, then you're stuck. Okay, everybody is going to go with the speed of that worker. Okay, so the question is how do we do it better? Okay, so what is happening in the ML arena is the, the, the approach that is being taken is what is referred to as a function-centric approach. Okay, so a what, what lot of the scalable ML algorithms, what they do is they, they focus on the function that they are trying to optimize and they look at the semantics of the function to reduce the amount of synchronization that is necessary. So, so there are, you know, if, if you pick up any paper in the last few years over uh, on, on this topic, you'll find that, you know, they have an ML abstraction, you know, their, their formulation, but then they will start talking about at the level of, of uh, 
you know, the memory operations, the read, the read operation and the write operation, and the race condition on the right, that's, that's where things are, okay? And then they have a, an extensive proof to show how the properties of, the, of their function can, can be guaranteed in spite of these synchronization violations. Okay, so this is where the things. So, so those of you, you know, I, I, you know if, you rem if you think about it is the question I, I started asking, why do the ML folks have to reason about low level details of the at the machine level, okay? In the same way that we could provide the transaction abstraction or atomicity abstraction at the database level, where any application can be built on top of it, why can't we do something similar? So that's kind of, that's a, you know, from an academic point of view or from a, from a, from a, from a research point of view, that's a good question to ask. Okay, so, so that basically what I'm saying is why can't we move from a process-based process, process -based synchronization to the data centric synchronization or data centric ap approach, which is what we use in the databases. And it turns out, and you have to take my word for it, is that if you sit down and start thinking about, you know, can I use a, a, a database system which does provides me two-phase locking, transaction abstraction, can I implement this iterative process that I just have talked about on top of the database? And it turns out the answer is no. Okay, and just 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 take my word for it. If if you want, you can we can talk about it. So. So you know, if you, if you are able to do that, then then you can do overlapping because then you what you do is you really don't have to wait for all the reads to happen or all the writes to happen. You can you can start doing look ahead computation and really wait whether wait is absolutely necessary at the data element level. And it turns out you can formulate you can take those conditions and you can transform those conditions to state stipulate them as follows. And this, this, this really significantly weakens the requirement. And here what it says is that if I'm, if I'm worker I and I'm reading a partition J, I don't have to wait for everybody else. I only have to wait for the writer who's, doing the, who's producing the partition J, okay? And similarly, if I am the writer who's, who's producing J, I only have to wait for everybody else to have read the, the partition J. I don't have to worry about whether they have read other partitions or not. If they have read my partition, then I can go ahead and do the computation. Okay? But isn't it like, because you do summation, you need to gradient descent. Yeah. So you are dependent on doing the aggregation step. Huh? Yes, so yes. Which means that everybody's writing. Huh? Everybody's right. But, okay. but you, still can, you, know, you still can get the overlap in terms of, of doing, doing the the receiving and, and, and communication o overlap. So, so with that, you know, if we, if, you know we, the initial evaluation, we are able to show that we can, we can do much better scaling compared to the bulk synchronous approaches. And, and uh, you know, with some number of iteration, you can get significant improvements, so, you know, 60, 70 improve, percent improvement over, over the BSP approaches. So I, what, I, what I gave you is really a picture of doing the feature partition. But in full generality, what you want to be able to do is you want to also deal with the data partitioning, and really you want to be able to go there. So I, I don't think I have answers to that, but this is what, this is what sort of the assignment looks like. Essentially what, what happens is you want, to f you want to have a characterization of what sequentially consistent execution mean in the context of iterative computations? Okay, that's, that's, it's something similar to the serializability in databases, something similar that you, you need to come up with that characterization. And then with that characterization, you can look at a data-centric approach and you can look at the process-centric approach and make sure that these approaches guarantee sequential consistency. Now, the interesting thing is once you have this formulation, you can in, obviously, on top of it, you can also al always add the, the notion of function semantics to be able to do better. Okay, so this is, this is where, you know, th I think an interesting area for, for work. And it might even have a hierarchy that's, that could be 
weaker, weaker assumption. So you can, for example, you can do bounded delay type of computation. So it, you can allow the workers to, or if if the change in the in the the values is not significant, then you can you can you can skip that. I mean, I think the given the nature of ML, you don't have to be completely completely synchronized in some sense. So, so just maybe a comment for the students on that, because uh, when I was giving the talk, uh, uh, I was talking about this optimistic fault tolerance, which essentially is a dual problem, because there you also uh, exploit the fact that you don't have to be fully consistent when you lose data. It's in a different application, but it's dual in a sense. Yeah. Which has to be but, but the point is that when you do this, uh, this loosely synchronous stochastic uh, gradient descent, the learning process itself will become much slower. Mm -hmm. So it takes time to do stochastic linear de um, gradient descent, for example, compared to, to, to the normal gradient descent. Mm -hmm. So I think we have also to see what is... That's, that's a, that, yeah, that's an interesting point. Right, yeah, right, right. So, so, so you... Yeah, so that's, that, 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 that's true. So you could, you could have less synchronization, but you might take longer yeah, to the converge. Learning, the, learning the convergence yeah. might be slower. But it is, it is, you know, nevertheless, I think it's a, an interesting interplay. Yeah. Yes. What about then, I mean, since you uh, have knowledge with what Google is doing, like, uh, with their I, automated vehicles and that, 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 that I, uh, I, I can only I can only tell you about the the Google's uh, you know the 2012 NLP paper and if you want to ask me questions about that I can tell you okay. but I, I otherwise I mean about the vehicles I I even I first of all I don't know because yeah. I'm far removed from that and even if I knew I think I wouldn't be able to tell but basically I think uh, <clears throat> in uh, so this is the the paper with Jeff Dean. This was in a, a NIPS conference in 2012. This is about deep learning, and this is essentially the, the multiple stages of neural network. And and the idea they have is the same: is that we we essentially, if if you try to do tight synchronization, it's too slow. So we allow things to happen kind of in a loose manner. And there is a statement in the paper which explicitly says that it says that. You know, we don't have any theoretical kind of, uh, we don't have theoretical formulation as to why this works, but nevertheless it works in practice and that's good enough. I mean, I think that's how, that's how the, it ends. <clears throat> I, I just want to say to the students, tomorrow we'll have a lot of machine learning sessions. So you, will, you can ask. Yeah. So it's it's actually it's a, it's a it's a really a fascinating, I think, interaction with the, with the machine learning folks. I think that's a, that's something really for us to to learn from. <laughs> real-time detect, you know, objects and this kind of things that do this kind of techniques apply there or is it something completely yes. different? When one, you once you create the model, the model works in real-time. Hmm? Because you have to create, this is the learning process. Yeah, right? so this is, the, this is sort of the offline process, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so what I'm going to do is in the, in the 10 minutes I have, I'm going to, to give you a little bit of, so I've been, you know, I spent about, I spent, uh, not last year, a year before, I spent a year embedded in a, in a product group, this, which is called Advertising Data Infrastructure, working with them, and I really was working at the level of a, of a, of a junior engineer. So I essentially wanted to understand and these, these, these technologies and what are the challenges and things like that. So it has been a very learning, you know, it has been a very fulfilling experience. And from there, obviously, I have formulated some of my own ideas. And what I'm presenting here are really my thoughts on where, the, where are the challenges and what we need to do. So, so, so the things that I've picked up is this notion of data centers. How should we view a data center? And how should we be designing applications and systems for that? The second thing is, is what is increasingly happening is is really there is you know we we talk about for a long time i think i only think about a database as being an, a single entity but in reality what happens is a data has to move through multiple stages and these are called data pipelines and actually there is a there is a talk today 
uh, in the later half of the, uh, in the in on on something called Cloudflow, Google Cloudflow, which is exactly trying to address the problem is that in in the context of large amounts of data, when multiple sources of data becomes available, then you have to create these data pipelines, and that really is becoming a challenge now. Okay, and then finally, I think the this is this is more to I think is is the issue of what Google, in Google they are referred to as multi-homing. In the outside world, in the in academia, it's called geo-replication, and I'm going to motivate this from a different point of view. I think. Okay, so so let me let me just uh, give you a a little bit of a story uh, about about this company called Dropbox. Okay, so I don't know how how many of you are familiar with that, but but I will tell you the evolutionary story which which I have, uh, which I kind of have understood. So, so Dropbox, uh, you know, as, as it is true with many successful companies, it started out in a dorm room. Okay, so if uh, if you guys are still a student, you have a you have a chance to become a billionaire. Otherwise, it's too late. So, so, <clears throat> so it, they basically started with a, you know, when it, they started out, they had a single machine, and which was which was a managed machine, their own machine, and they were using the cloud on primarily for as a gateway so that the users could access their machine. So they were running a server, if I may. Okay, they pretty soon realized that that's not a tenable solution. So what they did was, the, the next step what they did was essentially separated the computation from the data. So they had, they had dedicated machine for the data, managing the data, and a dedicated machine for doing the computations. And the data also, they separated into two parts. They separated the data into the file level data, that is the, that is the content of the files. So as you know, Dropbox is basically a file management system, right? And, and, and then there is a meta, metadata which is about the files and locations and the ownership. So that was, that was managed. And that was a critical data because that's, I think, is based, you know, maintained, told them everything about the current state of the system. And that they used it as MySQL type of a database technology to manage that data. And the file, it's file level content data, they basically uh, offloaded it to, it to Amazon S3. Okay? And then I think the, the next logical step was they realized that the, their single server was getting, getting loaded. And so they separated out the computation into three different parts logically, you know, so something that was serving the file data, something that was file, serving the file metadata, and some sort of notification server. So this is how they separated it. Okay, so this is, uh, you know, this is this, you know, so they basically went very rapidly from a single machine to this multiple machine architecture. They, were, they did it relatively quickly. The interesting thing was, then as, as, they, as they had to scale their service with the demand that was surging, they had to go to, to multi, kind of multi-machine architecture for each of their component. And they did it, but the, the, interest, the problem was that it took them about four years to go from, from here to here. And this is, by the way, this is based on the presentation that one of the Dropbox engineer gave. So I'm, 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 I'm based, I'm, all I'm doing is I'm regurgitating that story. So the question I think, you know, we as academics or researchers and, and students, you guys have to start thinking about it. Why does it take us so long to start from a sort of a, you know, multi-server architecture? So, you know, why, how, why does it take to move these infrastructure to a dis parallel and distributed environment, and and you know what are, what are the missing elements when we when when we are designing these things? So this is this is something that I don't think there are solutions there, but we we really have to figure out if we want to stay in the cloud arena. So, and I think my 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 thinking is that the reason is because we are used to the old way of thinking about machine as a single element. I think you have to start thinking about, about a new su computing substrate, new storage substrate, which is this data center. Okay? And, and what, what happens in the data center environment is there is a disaggregation and virtualization of resources. 
Okay, so basically now you want to be able to look at these processing elements and storage elements as 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 sort of utility components, and you should be able to you should be designing systems which really views these these components in that manner. Okay, so so here is where I think you know I I, I make a make a comparison between the grid computing and the cloud computing model is this is one of the so there are two things that, that distinguish the grid computing and the cloud computing is, is the virtualization. And the second thing is, in grid computing, you still took the classical model of a machine as being a wholesome entity, and that was the first class entity. And in the cloud computing model, that is no longer true. Okay? So, 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 when, so, so from a from a database point of view, I I don't know. I think the Mike Mike Stonebreaker, who's a who's a, who, who who won the Turing Award, he's, he he has gone on record as saying that he believes only in, the only model he believes is in the shared nothing model, uh, which is which is you know CPU and this the data and the computation should be together. And I I have to. And, and for, I have to disagree with him that in the cloud computing arena, that is not a tenable model. And the reason I'll give you are, are the following. So, so the, the classical shared nothing model, which brings, puts the CPU and the disk together, has this problem with the scaling out and scaling in issue, where you know, if you want to scale out your, comp your queries from, from 10 machines to 100 machines, you can't take your data and, and move, it, move it around. Okay, so that's, that's, that's one, one reason. And the other reason is the fault tolerance. I think in, in you know, if, if something, f you know, if, a, if, your, if, the, if your machine containing the database fails in the cloud computing, I mean, the whole idea of the cloud is that, you know, the failure doesn't matter because you always have something else to go on to. And if you, if you make this thing together, then the problem is how do you go and use the, the, uh, the available resources. So there is, there is this necessity of disaggregating the storage from the computation. So that's kind of one way of thinking about it. So once you, once you accept that, then, then kind of the conceptual model in, in which you are, will go about building you know, a database technology or some other application would be the following, is that you basically maintain a storage layer and you want to make your storage layer fault tolerant and everything, right? And, and you have a DBMS controller, which is going to con kind of orchestrate the database activity or database execution by having, allowing multiple servers to be ex ex instantiated depending upon the workloads. And each DBMS server itself should be able to have enough kind of flexibility to be able to instantiate workable pools based on based on their workload characteristics. So if there is a query, if the if there is a query plan which requires you to execute a, a query on ten machines, then it should be able to do that. So that's kind of is what where we should be going towards. Yes, Saif. So, uh, but again, you have to build a distributed storage layer. Yeah, you have to build a distributed storage layer. <laughs> and the distributed storage layer, even if you view it as a one entity, itself is consistent of components. And maybe these components are even distributed. Yeah, so, so, so at the distributed storage layer, you have to deal with the fault tolerance issues, your application, and all that. But, but essentially, but, but yeah, yeah, everything. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so you're just pushing the pushing this. to a different level. No, no, but I, I think the migration, I, I don't think migration should be there, but I think you have to have enough redundancy at the level that you would, you you would have some guarantee as to or some oh, okay. some so some guarantee. Yes, yes. So there has to be redundancy so that there is availability of your data. It's a, it's a lot of movement. To yeah. A lot of network stuff. Yeah, yeah. But I think there's no way around it. Like what yeah. did Todd, Todd Walter from Terra like said nice, very nicely? I think what is uh, data is as elastic as a brick wall. Yeah. So, and I think projecting forward, I think what's what I think is going to happen is. Even the, dis the, sh the memory that exists in this data center is going to become disaggregated. So you will you will have a, sh a shared memory, which back is going again. to be yeah back again. <laughs> this is my this is my projection. So there are 
there are issues. Uh, there is a network and IO latency mitigation. I think that's the way you have to deal with it is batching and pi pipelining of data accesses. There is a there are significant challenge in terms of query execution. Now you have the flexibility of you know there is another level of freedom when you we, we decide on a optimization plan, how many machines to use, and and, and you know just. Using more machines does not ma make the queries run faster. I believe me. Take it for the, I mean, it doesn't ha happen. You know, it can it can slow your queries significantly down if you use more machines sometimes. So this is this is a, remains a challenge. I'm not an expert in that. And finally, the data replication is whether you do it at database level or at block level. My my personal choice would be is I you know I'm I'm a, I'm a database guy, but I'm not a chauvinistic database guy. I think. There are good ideas comes from the systems arena, and then I think the file systems people have done that block level replication, and that's a much better solution. Okay, so I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to I, I'm, I'm going to speed up. Uh, so, so the next thing is, uh, as I said, you know, if you if you look at the advertising internet advertising platform, it, it looks a, a complicated thing. But basically, what happens is you have a database where you maintain the advertiser and publisher information, your clients. And what what you do is is uh, from a from a company like Google point of view, whenever there are there are queries and ad clicks, you essentially you log them, and then then from there you pull up pull up all that information and try to push it into the database so that you can charge your advertisers and public you know pay your publishers and and charge your advertisers. So so there is a lot of lot of processing that has to happen in terms of picking up the ad clicks, figuring out the corresponding query, and 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 all that. So if you really peep inside, you know it really looks like I'm 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 obviously uh, sensationalizing this, but this is how the the, the structure looks. It's it's plumbing, and and now you have to remember. So this is just like in the context of one product. So if, if you have a company like Google or, or Yahoo or Amazon, which have multiple products, each product will have something like this, this plumbing, trying to pull the data from the logs and pushing it into your, your, your database. Now if you think about it, an ad click from a business point of view, even though it's a very small amount of money, it is a transaction. And the question is, why can database technology be built so that this can be inter in internalized exactly as a as a banking trans transaction that you do it today? Okay, and and the and the answer is basically it you know we don't we don't have the right solution, but I think this is this would be the something that we would want to go go to. But in general, I think the 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 general problem of trying to to set up these pipelines. In a in a in a quick and robust manner is is really a, a big challenge. Okay, so I I'm not going to s let me let me not say much. But basically, I'm going to say is that geo replication or multi homing. There there are a lot of my my colleagues, database colleagues, senior database colleagues who would argue that oh the geo replication and multi homing is only important for a handful of companies. The rest of the world doesn't need it. But believe me, I think it is an important problem. I think you know, once as soon as you have a deployed service in the internet, so you take the Ubers, the, you know, something which may become the Uber from five years from now, they all are going to need it. And the the problem is, is obviously you want to you are worried about the data, but more importantly, it's from an operational point of view. This is what happens when you're running these 24 by 7 services. Okay, if your provider says that there is something wrong with my data center, you have to take all your, and even if they give you a month's notice, taking your entire infrastructure and moving it from one place to the other is a big undertaking. You know, you have, you have these services which are running on thousands of machines, they have like active state, trying to move it in runtime from one data center to the other is a significant challenge. Just to provision this automat automatic failover, you have to be able to do geo-replication or what is referred to as multi-homing. And, and internally in Google, what has happened is they really, this multi-homing came about not because they were worried about the data, but because of these operational reasons. They were, they were periodically, they were finding it that when they have to move things over from, transition over from one data center to the other, 
you know, invariably it was a very, very labor intensive and, and prone to, to making a small error could blow up in their faces. And, and as a result, what they have done is, essentially they have used uh, a, a cross data center replication layer in many of their infrastructures, and that is based on the spanner technology. I'm going to stop here, and I'm going to get to my... So I'm just going to wrap up. So essentially what I'm saying is that in the cloud computing arena, the, the three aspects that you have to talk, think about is scalability, reliability, and elasticity. And, and given that we are living in, in an, a data-centric environment, you have to, to figure out how to re-architect the database technology. Big data analytics and learning, I think scalability, just having the right framework to be able to do scalable analysis of data is, is, is a big challenge. And from a, from a big data pragmatics point of view, I think uh, that complex data processing pipelines remains an open era. So the, for example, today that the talk that you're going to hear on Google Data Flow is essentially is, is a single, single day data center solution. If you want to extend it to multi-data center solution or multi-home solution, it's a significant challenge. And, and, and that's, I think, is where we are. I'm sorry to have taken no, no, no. time. No okay. so. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> okay. We might take one question from the professor <laughs> if you want. And then. Otherwise, then uh, let's thank okay. again. Thank you very much.